Hello, and welcome back to Literally Literary. If this is your first time joining us, be sure to check out our previous episodes. This episode, we are continuing our discussion on Promises of Gold by Jose Olivares. In this episode, we'll be discussing the second half of the collection. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I looked so silly. <laughs> All right. We left off on section six. Yes. Promises of gold. And Richie was laughing a lot, so I think you should start. Oh, hello, oh, hello. Yeah, this section. <laughs> I was laughing a lot. Um, I think Jose does have this this brand of humor. It's very clever. It's, um, and I, we've talked about this before. Like, I feel like even as a poet, he's he's very playful a lot of times as well, even in these instances. So, I mean. The first poem, for example, of this 75, Nate calls me soft. Um, I underline the word soft just because it's, it's something that I bring up. I mean, in context here, you know, men always like to be hard, right? Tough, you know, like mm. unreadable. And I highlighted soft and wrote under that, what's wrong with soft? You know, and that's kind of one of the things that comes up all throughout because his first line here we referenced in the previous episode and we will see in more poems, right, is if we were better at being honest, maybe it wouldn't take a bottle of something strong to make us talk straight, right? Love that opening line. And then uh, I guess I just kind of laughed at the image of this at the end of this poem because, you know, he says, um, next time I see you, I'll slap away the dap, pull you in close and tell you under the ordinary streetlights how much I love you and that you still ain't shit. So I like how he <laughs> takes it down and, and kind of does that little bit of a pushback, like, because I, I, for me personally, I have friends like this, and I, and I think a lot of people too, where you can kind of, kind of talk smack with each other, like playfully, right? Um, but it, that is kind of almost like a wall or like a guard too, right? Where you, can, you know, you can't just hug it out and say I love you. You gotta, you gotta pull back. <laughs> you ain't shit. <laughs> but I don't know. Um, I think that's a great opening poem because it does kind of fit thematically with with others, and I'm, I'm sure you guys mm-hmm. probably pulled out those as well so mm-hmm. i don't know if any of you guys had anything to say about that opening poem just that it's it's an opening poem that references another poet you know nate marshall whom i recommend uh you know i can't remember the name of the collection but um <clears throat> you know a lot of these uh poets are poems are on behalf of other poets that he mm-hmm. knows so I, I really like that about this collection. And, and then there's, of course, the intertextuality in, in your opening poem that we get with um, the most, if, if it's the one in English on 79. Yeah, that's another one. You know, yeah. that connects to that kind of um, closes that loop, so to speak. But I don't know if, if someone had something before that. Well, 77, too, kind of just references that, too, right? Like, all the names we say because we don't say love, right? It's just just a list, and I, I like it as a simple poem, and it ties thematically to the one we were just talking about and the one that I think most of us will want to talk about, which is most. But uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Cal City Love Poem. Did anyone have that one? Um, I just wanted to say something about it. Oh, yeah. Um, I liked how throughout this collection, food is love, and food is a way of showing love. Um, and I like how this one does that as well. Um, and I guess just like the idea that there's different ways that you can show someone love. And we talked about this, like with the first collection, the first half of the collection. Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so embarrassing. Um, I was saying. Who does love? Yes. But. In the first half of the collection. I totally lost it. Oh, <laughs> I totally man. lost hmm. my idea. Music, healing, um, love throwing words out <laughs> <laughs> no i well i guess the, the main point that i wanted to get across was like the idea that there is different ways to show love um and then this one's like how um i guess in the fourth stanza um it says my mom will feed you like your belly is my own um and just like another way that like a lot of times especially in i think our culture um food is how people say they love you without actually saying i love you yeah so i really like it. It's definitely my mom love language. Mm. Yeah. You see food part of the family, like that's how you know she loves you. Yeah. 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 Like you're in. <laughs> yeah. I do like how he equates that, right? Like your belly is my own. Mm-hmm. That's love. <laughs> yeah. This is not to Willie Perdomo. I know they work together on the the what is it, the break what is it the po- collection again? Break Break Beat Beat Poets. Breakbeat poets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of uh poet flexes. Mm. If I may say so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would too. I mean, if I had 
<laughs> if yeah. I could flex, I would. <laughs> you know, say if you're listening to this, throw, throw in a little love to uh, us peeps here in El Paso, you know? That'd be the coolest. <laughs> so I'm at a giant star next to that. It's come up already several yeah. times, right? Mm-hmm. The past collection and this one already. Oh, is it just the simplicity of it? It's one stanza, but mm-hmm. it kind of reiterates this theme that we've already seen. The, the kinds of Mexican masculine love that we see, you know, in the... I think in on the one hand, like we can see it as like machismo because like they're not being open with their feelings. Mm. But on the other, I mean, it's kind of the camaraderie also of like, you know, just having beers with your compas and like, you know. And I guess that's the only time when you <laughs> you open up and. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good times. Sometimes bad times, but <laughs> mostly good times. Most times good times. Oh. Most. Ah. Nice. <laughs> um. The discoteca one, how, I'm curious to see how that one was translated or like if mm. there's anything. Is there like a particular line just because? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know because I mean the poem itself is like, I guess the title, right? Mm-hmm. Mercedes says she prefers the word discoteca, the word club. Mm-hmm. So I think it just mm-hmm. brings up kind of the issue of translation and mm-hmm. choosing what you want to use. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, in Spanish, of course, we also get the discoteca, you know, dice que prefiere la palabra discoteca, la palabra club. Um Mis amigos son traviesos y malcriados y sinvergüenzas. Déjame traducir. DJ Cash Era era está haciendo sudar las paredes. It's a line that jumps out at me. Yeah, just, I mean, like, the idea of discoteca meaning more fun, mm. right? Like, in the way he, mm. he describes it. That's, the question is, is it, is it uns, 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 or is it uns, ponchi, 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 <laughs> That also is a translation thing, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it ends with the title of the chapter, too. Mm. Yeah. And it's a chicken singing, ojalá, ojalá, ojalá. <laughs> it's an awesome image. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Also, like how uh, he talked about the police state. He's like, mm-hmm. maybe part of not using clubs is police police carry clubs. It's mentioned, too, right? Mm-hmm. Keep mm-hmm. your clubs. In this poem, in this poem, there is no police. Hence the fun. <laughs> yeah, and then just the plain language. And I kind of... I mean, I know it's ojalá, 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 and that's how it ends, but I kind of expected that poem to be in the untranslatable mm. section just because there's so many words that don't really mm. translate directly from Spanish to English, mm-hmm. discoteca being one of them. Oh, yeah. But I see why it's in the ojalá, ojalá section. Too. Yeah. But it threads, right? Yeah. Section five was receding. I thought <clears throat> untranslatable was the section before. It was poor that. Mm. Mind. <laughs> story yeah so we're in section seven which is god origin story made me laugh a lot that's when i was laughing a lot i like this one <laughs> i put a little heart next to it yeah just uh, the opening lines are hilarious yeah right because <laughs> he, he kind of pulls that like that again his humor the way my mom tells it my dad was the most handsome the way my dad tells it my dad was the most handsome like that's it's <laughs> a great opening line um, but the one that really makes me laugh is uh, my dad doesn't tell this story, which means it's true. Like, I guess thought about this piece. I guess this one just mostly made me think about like when my mom tells me about how my parents met, mm. um, which I guess is like the cool thing. Like as a, as someone reading it, you kind of reflect back on your own life and like the stories that you have of your parents. Mm. Like living, you know, living with a cell phone and kind of for us, like that was true right right up to, up until high school and so kind of thinking about the generational gap that you referenced in the first part is how um like this you know gen z readers are going to interpret that because for them i mean it's really hard to imagine right but for us like it's easy to imagine that the trope of throwing rocks at the windows mm-hmm. <laughs> my dad would send my mom faxes yeah yeah oh. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. And then be the facts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this made me think about um, my mom and dad's origin story too. So I thought it was really sweet, just a sweet and humorous uh, piece. But um, yeah, I think it, it is interesting to see or to think about how certain readers will read this poem and if they'll pick up on those kinds of things, like how difficult it was to communicate back then or Mm -hmm. couldn't send just like a heart emoji crush (laughs) so easy you guys have it so easy (laughs) (laughs) come here come the comments you know yeah (laughs) come at me 
I do like how this story's uh, this section is is God, and typically, mm. you know, you have an origin story like Adam and Eve, or like mm. there's a lot of uh, different cultures have different stories, right? And I like how this is just my parents, mm. and then how there's always like multiple sides of the story. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, you know, this this poem starts with the um, like his dad being El Mas Guapo, and it's interesting the previous you know section ended with fail, right? The the speaker mm. imagining contrast. himself as such. This one I have is, is kind of not not really the whole piece, but eighty eight. Mm-hmm. I didn't need before. Mm. Oh yeah. Oh, there's that one. I was just yeah. wondering if you had one. Before. Oh. I just well, my favorite line because I do remember he read this one. Uh, Jose read this one as well when we we welcomed him welcomed him to Zoom that session, which also you can find online. But God, I don't know why I love this line so much. I, I remember writing it down when I heard it. Language like vision gets blurry at a distance. Oh. Mm. <laughs> I was envious and like, oh god, that line's so good. <laughs> but I like how it's kind of the contrast between him, you know, being in Harvard and, and studying, and kind of contrasting it to back home and, and thinking about his his dad as a worker, and you know, he kind of keeps bringing up the imagery of like the bills. The bills come around. It's always like a high tension, high anxiety. So it's like talking about the thing academically, like mm. away from it, and then actually living it. I like that mm. that contrast. Yeah, that's all I want to yeah. say about that one. I really love that line. Do <laughs> you have any others from that section? Or? I had Miracle on page 91. Okay. <clears throat> um, this one's kind of like talking about during COVID times, a little bit after-ish. Um, and a line that really stood out to me was um, towards the middle of the poem. It says, we burn the dead. We try to contain our grief like children trying to keep a butterfly alive. In a sealed jar miracle, we are alive. Um, And I just think it's interesting to think about, like, life before the pandemic and even today, like, how things are just so different, Um, but we are alive. I don't know. It's just, like, an interesting thing to think about. But, like, I think, especially after the pandemic, like, there, a lot of us do hold a lot of grief, um, but we're just, like, surviving still and, like, going back to our lives, I guess. And it's just, like... Not the same. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And to take a toll, right, on our relationships. Um, I do like how he gets into the romantic here a little bit, right? He talks about his lover's touch kind of being that same kind of uh, miracle as, as water mm-hmm. being turned to wine. Mm-hmm. Great, right? And, he, and yeah, I like his uh, attachment to time there, which is something we were definitely able to, to think so much about during quarantine, right? Mm-hmm. We're here too briefly to ignore the miracle of touch. How when my lover touches me, my body turns into something like wine. The social experiment. Huh. Really enjoy any Ars Poetica poems just because of the meta ness of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I I really appreciate this one, and I appreciate his humor in this one as well. How he's like plot twist remix, you know, <laughs> <laughs> throughout and asking questions in between the poem, redacting things, and so it's it's cool um, in many ways, I guess, but. He's still playful in it, but still bringing in very important topics like migration and capitalism again. Capitalism. And mm-hmm. I like how it ends with the what do they call it when um, the blackout, right? The blackout, mm-hmm. um, you know, for what why poetry, por qué poemas, sir, redacted, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think in the in his author's note, he even said how he doesn't like answers, mm-hmm. right? It's more about the questions, it's more about the questions, mm-hmm. yeah. Which is what I try to tell my students, too, all the time. I really like that, too. Mm-hmm. It's just mm-hmm. ask the questions. Even if you're afraid of the answer, if you don't mm-hmm. get an answer ever, like, it's important to still be asking those questions. Yeah. That's not what's important here. But just all the ways that, like, we're exposed to, like, toxic forms of life, right? Whether it's the U.S., Mexico, and, yeah. I tried to become American, but America is toxic. I tried to become Mexican, but Mexico is toxic. Yeah, and that, that line, my family started migrating in 1987 and they never stopped. That's something that keeps coming up to as similar lines in other poems. There's that in-betweenness to write the Nacia Media Migración, which those of us in the border, I mean, we can maybe really just as well, if not more, because of how we're always crossing the border here. Mm-hmm. In between the mineral spaces. They definitely getting more experimental, right? Next one, Eviction Notice. Very quick poem, too. But he does a, not a blackout, but he does a cross out, mm-hmm. right? Which mm-hmm. makes makes it a lot more interesting to read. Parenthetical thought. You guys have you, Arad? 
Yeah. I imagine. <laughs> what do you think about that one? Um, I mean, just like the same thing I was talking about earlier, um, just the idea of music working to heal. Um, and as I, I guess like, um, I think like in some of the previous poems, they've talked about like singing. Um, and then um, I guess just like as a way to help you keep going in a sense. Um, like this one, it's talking about his dad being laid off. Um, and then it just goes on to say, he didn't cry or complain, complain or cry. Um, I remember finding him in the living room, moving his feet to all the words he couldn't say. And I guess just like this idea that music puts your feelings and what you're thinking into thoughts and just allows you to, I guess, feel them in a different way. Um, yeah. Like the poem you talked about earlier, right? Where yeah. it's like you kind of keep keep going on and kind of yeah. you have to take take the steps. And here he's literally taking those steps mm. mm-hmm. to the words he couldn't say in his feet. Yeah. yeah. And also that this is a, a cultural tradition that he's bringing from, you know, his hometown, right? His mm. Mexico and, the, you know, going back to the idea of migration and like how we mm-hmm. migrate, not just as people, as bodies, but also with our traditions and our culture. Is he, is, he, is he listening to Chenta there? <laughs> so frequently asked questions. You guys had on <laughs> FAQ. Kind of like how he kind of does like a Matryoshka doll of images there. Mm. Underneath all my poems is this, and then there's this, and then there's this. Kind of, again, going back to that humor, like <laughs> frequently asked questions. There's a boy in every poem with a bowl cut and a middle finger in response to all your questions. There are no walls in my poem. Back to like no police. And it's like, ah. again, like that sacred poetry can be. In- no migra. Yeah. Yeah. I guess going to the next section, Glory. I mean, that first poem, right? Between Us and Liberation, kind of reference mm-hmm. water. It's always kind of been a kind of landmark issue, too, in, in terms of class and poverty, right? Who has access to good water and versus polluted water or, I mean, there's pipeline issues all, all mm-hmm. throughout. So, I like, again, it's another short poem, too, right? Like, straight into the point. <laughs> forget about liberation. Can we get water without the contaminants or in this case lead in it? It reminds me also of some of the protest poetry that we've seen with like Acevedo and um, uh, with Angie Thomas's work, you know, also deals a lot with like the idea of protest. <coughs> in Taco Bell with Mexicans. I remember that one. <laughs> a little like ode to Torti kind of. Mm-hmm. And again, like the Americanized versus tradition. Mm-hmm. Capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Good one. Brothers are extra Mexican. What does that mean? She asked. I repeat, extra Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, it's like that again, but the, the in between, but also the mixing of the two. And like they talk to her in English, but they laugh at their own jokes in Spanish. And obviously, Taco Bell is the butt of the joke here, but it's more than more than that. It's just uh, that conversation of food again, you know, <clears throat> what is authentic and what is sacred and what is Mexican. Thank you. The next one you referenced for Reina about stop. Uh, maybe God should stop cracking jokes all the time. Yeah, I love this poem too. There are always fifteen crema tubs in our fridge, and none had crema. <laughs> it's always another trope too, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I love that. Maybe we should have been grateful for prayers we could eat, or maybe God should stop cracking jokes all the time. Mm-hmm. Maybe God is Mexican is the title of that poem. And I appreciate that too. And and throughout the poetry, like he'll say like Mexican Jesus does this or says that. So <laughs> um, also nice to, to claim that and to reimagine God as a chismoso God or mm-hmm. a funny God, not just vengeful. Mm-hmm. I also like that one because it kind of goes back to the whole idea of being love. Because um, I think ultimately the idea for this one is like they didn't have money so they had the food that they had but then they would continue to pray for more money but they never got more money they just got more food so they weren't getting more money it was just being used to buy more food um so their parents were ultimately just showing them love with their food mexican heaven (laughs) return yeah (laughs) several more Mm -hmm. Yeah, collection, which is cool to see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I hope he keeps including them in, in his book. Yes. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of references here to like manual labor, you know, mm-hmm. and kind of going back to like the immigrant culture and Mexican American culture, Chicano culture, you know, these working class jobs, like, you know, being a mechanic, um, being a cook, maid, or 
you know, custodian. Mm-hmm. And this section is glory. So again, it's, I think that's kind of a nice also way to see um, jobs glorified and mm-hmm. given their flowers, you know, mm-hmm. um, instead of being down on mm-hmm. down. Back-to-back glories. Mm-hmm. Section 10 is also glory. And 11. These are, I mean, start getting a little heavier and talking about loss. And mm-hmm. I, um, one of the ones that I would read, um, cause I do the Monday night, uh, online open mics. And one of the things that we do is there is, uh, the cover poem because mm-hmm. if musicians can do it, so can poets, right? Give a little credit. Mm-hmm. So I remember reading inspiration, um, as soon as I got this book is one of them. Uh, the year's first cherry blossoms are just trying to catch some sun. And here you go, poet. Making grand proclamations about the cycle of life. Seeing some wild corny mess like nature is healing. Props to the meme, right? Nature took a mental health day just like you. Winter is long and humans aren't the only creatures that suffer from loneliness. I really love that. Mm. And a build up. Reading that one out loud. And again, like the meta nature of a lot of these poems, you know, referencing to like going back to Ars Poetica. Like what it is that we do with poetry that makes it. Um, a special art form yeah <laughs> yeah and i remember that was such a, a prevalent meme as uh towards the end of quarantine and everything right everyone was talking about how nature's healing and <laughs> was a, <laughs> meme that that joke that mm-hmm. meme yeah because a lot of those were like anti-capitalist right of how like a mcdonald's taking over by like lions or something like that you know yeah some of them right <laughs> Pretty striking image, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did anyone have one before 123 after that one? Uh, de la Justicia para los Vivos, um, uh, to me, was my, uh, you know, one that I actually talked about with my students in terms of, like, um, you know, Black Lives Matter. Because I think, of course, the pandemic in and of itself was, you know... Um, a health issue but it was also an issue of, of of like environmental justice and like of um of social and racial justice because it happened during george floyd as well you know in 2020 and so i i want to say that um perhaps this is the, the uh, jose alluding to that and i think it's an interesting concept you know los muertos no pueden obtener justicia así como ya no pueden levantarse and um you know kind of um the idea of like when we hold rallies and when we organize, when we, you know, go to march and protests, you know, right now there's a lot going on with Palestine, as you guys know. And uh, so uh, it's an interesting thought experiment of like, you know, should we really fight for those we have lost? Should we focus on like those who are living? And I mean, of course, we could just do both. But um, yeah, that one hits harder. Mm mm-hmm. <laughs> Even that Mexican heaven is just pretty rough, right? Mm. The title, right? This is where we get the title. Mm-hmm. Leo meme. <laughs> oh, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that's a, a killer line. Uh, a heavy one, but uh, maybe heaven is just a museum of all the life we have extincted. We are death machines building death machines. Grim, when he says this, this collection comes in waves, right? Uh, the celebration as well as the, the mourning. Yeah. Mm. Oh, even the last line, I do like that, right? We imagined gold and not the melting that gold requires. Mm. I guess all the glory, right? Without thinking about what gets you the glory. Mm. Instruction, as he says, right? Think did. Brings us to the next section, right? They're all glories. Glory, glory, mm. glory. Three of them. Does it all lead up to an hallelujah? <laughs> you have to edit out a lot of silence. I always <laughs> I always have to. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting with the Pope. Kind of, right? You kind of have to experience them again. <laughs> So there's heavy ones, but I, I'm just going back and like the ones that visually make me laugh, like the rebuttal one was hilarious mm-hmm. by Eric uh, after Jose. Mm-hmm. The sounds of NBA 2K drift into my office and you hear this you say, play some defense, bro. What are you doing? <laughs> People say love is a fancy dinner, diamonds and lingerie, but this too is love. <laughs> I think that's just such a nice moment captured, right? Like, Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so Erica Wright wrote this one. It's interesting. Mm-hmm laughing at the mexican heaven no no i was just laughing at that mm. at that moment because it's very relatable yeah i mean when, when you have when you're really close to someone like that right it's just, it's just a little things like those little for sure yeah but i do like that mexican too the one mm-hmm. on 129 
again, it's like these things that are so holy and just like poking fun or that are meant to be seen as, oh, you can't talk about heaven that way. My uncle got to heaven. He texted me and told me the party was born. <laughs> <laughs> no mariachi or dancing, tuxedos and gowns, hips like rusty hinges. What about La Chona? Stiff as La Llorona. <laughs> <laughs> Loved it. I like in this one, he just he just kind of adds in the ha-ha. <laughs> Base between heaven and hell. Another shout out, right? Pedro. Stop ripping off his poems. It's good. I like that. Self awareness. A big chunk of these start getting written during the pandemic because it's like isolation, loneliness. It's mm -hmm. uh, reflection, right? He talks about listening to music and again, the ancestors, his uncles, right? Kind of being there and it's not. It's a cleansing. I does right. Oh, that's 131. Yeah. Through music. <laughs> yep. And the birds too, kind of being a little mm -hmm. bit of that music. Like mm -hmm. they're annoying, but he says, I hope, I hope they come back again in spring. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, again, these moments like being like with, with a loved one and here he's, he's kind of like cleaning the sink. Right. And another humorous moment where he, he's holding this gunk, like it's a uh, Yorick, right. From, from Hamlet, mm -hmm. like some Shakespearean skull. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing good or bad, but loving makes it so. And it just like that comfort of having your, your loved one in the other room. I think he says Twitter, text favorite jokes. But you never thought you'd see a poem better and Twitter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's a nice blend of like this collection of like low culture and high culture, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of false mm -hmm. dichotomy that we see. We definitely talked that a lot about that in Citizen Illegal, right? Mm. Pop culture, Wolverine, all the music. Mm -hmm. Mentions little John in here, you know, the clip, like mm -hmm. uh, all the music, lots of music again, like you said. Big C. Have the occasional poem on 135. Although now I'm thinking like several of these poems are technically occasional too because they were written during quarantine, like mm -hmm. about quarantine. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that would count. <laughs> um, but this one is. For the occasion of a wedding. How lucky would you be to get Jose Olivares to write a poem for your wedding? Only if you mention hot Cheetos. Yeah. <laughs> and tortillas and tacos in Mexican heaven. <laughs> I really love the, the closing poem. Mm -hmm. You know, another of, of his brother's uh, poems and just the, you know, kind of opening the door for the reader in a way is how I interpret this one. Because it's not Jose anymore, you know, it's someone else. And um, again, kind of the emphasis on like, to me, one of the themes is like, find your voice within the work of, you know, even if you're not Mexican American, but just whatever your voice is. And like, you know, you could text a poem, right? You could, you could tweet it. You could, um, you know, you, you don't have to have it in this form. And, um, and just the, the um, I guess you could call it irony of like the Pedro doesn't really, you know, going back to like the Harvard high culture right is you know you don't need to have this kind of you know high level education you know to be a, a, po a poet and i think that it, how important it is for jose for it to be accessible mm -hmm. is something that you see when you talk to him right he's so accessible as a human being and it's kind of one of the first things me and vanessa noticed right when we first met him at the one of the book festivals I also really liked this one. Um, it makes me think of like when I'm working with students in the writing center. Um, mm -hmm. They'll be writing poems or little short stories, memoir essays, things like that, where I'm trying to show them how to create more imagery. Mm -hmm. I'll be like, well, think of your five senses. Like, what were you seeing? What were you hearing? What song is playing in the background? And I think this one does a really good job of showing that there is so many different ways to describe such a little simple thing that you're seeing. Like in this one, um, just like the, the sky being the subject, like mm -hmm. different ways to describe what they're seeing in the sky with like the clouds and what are they doing. Um, but yeah, I really like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really love his uh, sense of excitement, you know, to like be able to connect with his brother now in this way. Like, mm -hmm. what, what are you on? What are you reading? Like, I just I see things differently now, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. like that's fun. And that's what it's supposed to, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. enjoy. He yeah. gets to share that here. I think that's one of the goals, right? As as poets, mm -hmm. I think all of us here are poets and, you know, that we do try to reach out to the, I guess, like non-poets, right? Or like family, friends, you know, and I think it's really inspirational to see something like this, um, how he's kind of just spreading the, the good word, so to speak, of mm -hmm. poetry. So to sum it up, this book is dope. <laughs> <laughs> Está bien chido. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, there you go again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Take us to the promised land. Okay. <laughs> Ready? Thanks for joining us on this episode of Literally Literary, recorded at Power at the Pass and brought to you by Border Census. This episode, we continued our discussion on Promises of Gold by Jose Olivares. If you haven't read it, we hope we inspire you to pick up a copy. Join us on our next episode and follow us on Instagram at literallyliterary.ep.